So now joining the show, Terry Rady from Peerless Performance Systems. Appreciate you jumping on, sir. Nice. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, those who don't follow you on Instagram, followed you uh, when you're a competitive strongman. You are you're an accomplished strongman. I wanted to have you on to talk about coaching, but 2016, 2018 world champ, 2019 America's Strongest Man. Um, what have you been able to take from that successful strongman career and apply it to your coaching side of things? Oh man. Uh, honestly, the, uh, realistic perspective, because people like in like, you know, whenever I'm inboarding a new client, like one of the first things we talk about is what are your goals? What are your goals for the sport? What do you want to accomplish? Where do you see your career? And, you know, more times than not people, I want to be world's strongest man. I want to, you know, win this. I want to win that. I want to win the Arnold. I want to do what you did. And, uh, you know, historically speaking in terms of like, especially in one Oh five, I'm very undersized, you know, uh, I'm five, five, ten and a half on a good day. Um, you know, five eleven on my old Tinder profile <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, graduating high school I was 160 pounds. So, you know, I, I put in, I've been strength and conditioning for 20 plus years, um, uh, put in a lot of work, but I, the, the path I went down to get to where I got was so, um, I, what's the word I'm looking for was so, um, individually consuming of me, not only as, um, like a, a person and time management skills, but also as an individual on like a personal level, like it consumed me to the point where, um, you know, my wife and I just talked about this the other day. I have a lot of resentment actually towards my strongman career because of the bridges I burned, the person I was, how I communicated, um, you know, and it, it, to get to that level, it requires, um, you know, I don't want to disparage anybody in the sport, but uh, knowing the people I know and the things that those people have achieved, it requires almost this um, blind sense of like narcissism, right? Um, you know, to, to get to that level. And it's not in, in the time, it's not a bad thing to you. But when you can like take a step back and reflect on your career, most people will reflect on their career and say, Oh my God, I did these great things. I was, I did this, I did that. But when you get to like a deeper level of it and you see, okay, well I did this, but who was I while I was doing that? You right. know, that's the type of thing where you're like, okay. So, you know, uh, when I inboard new people, I kind of have to like, you know, let them know like, Hey, I, I see this journey. I I'm listening to you. I know what you want to do, but I need you to understand to achieve those things in the short term. You're not going to like the person you become to achieve those things in the long term. That's something that, you know, requires like that marathon mindset. And most people don't like that. Right. You know, I'm sure in your experience, most people don't like the 10 years, right? Um, they don't, they don't like that. They want it now. You know, I've got a couple of clients that started working with me in the last year and they just, they, they, they want to show, you know, but they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I look at my numbers and I'm not at the OSG level yet. Like I wouldn't even be able to podium at OSG. And it's like, well, yeah, duh. There are people there that have been doing this for a decade. Like you think that you're just going to come into the sport in one year and dominate it. No. You know, and then uh, when they realize, oh, there's not a lot of money in this, there's not. And it's like, well, no, there's not. This is, you know, your career is where you make money. You're not going to make a career out of this. Like you right. need very few people can. And I don't know. Yeah, you know? I don't I don't know if that can be emphasized enough how few people make a career off it. Like even top, top performers that we see. Right. In any sport, CrossFit. Right. Like, like it's not right. It, yeah. I, I think, I think you made such an awesome point there. And it's something I see with newer lifters is like once they get past, cause when you start strength training, you've been in it for so long, you know, 20 plus years, you, like you said, uh, of, of training, when you get past that little instant gratification that everyone gets when they first start training, people say newbie gains, whatever they call it. And then it actually gets hard where mm -hmm. you have to have that, 
heart to heart with someone to explain, Hey, it took me two and a half years to put five pounds on my deadlift. Like, are you willing to, to wait until, you know, you're 28 right now. Are you wait ready to wait till you're 31 to hit a five pound deadlift PR? Because that's how hard it can get when you get to that level. So is that, is that something like you find really difficult with explaining to your clients? Like, Hey, you know, yes, I did win a world championship, two world champions. I was America's strongest man, but, but like the sacrifices and everything I had to give up may not be worth it for you, or you may not even be able to achieve it. Like, is that? Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody has these lofty goals, but at the end of the day, let's say that there are three major contests a year, America's strongest man, world's strongest man. And I'll say, you know, uh, the Arnold, uh, and then Charmaine Corp Nationals, I guess. When you think about it, there are in your weight class four first place, you know, medals, and there are a thousand people, right? You know, and it's like you have to be the person that is individually the one, you know, that's able to achieve that. And you know, people will have their heart broken when it doesn't happen, but they don't understand, like. I talked to clients of mine about this. I I didn't win a contest for the first four years of my career. I didn't even, I didn't win a single show. I would get close. I would lose by like half a point, you know, Michael LePet. If you're listening, Michael, uh, he's still a friend of mine. If you're listening to this, uh, he is one of the only guys I still have not to this day, still have not beaten (laughs) son of a gun. Um, It's uh, you know, you have to, love the struggle you have to love the sport and that's what it was for me is i loved the struggle and i love the sport like i don't compete anymore but i do jujitsu now uh and you know there's tons of people they they always say you either uh live you either die doing strongman or you live long enough to do jujitsu <laughs> um, you know and it's now i'm doing that but it's a new challenge it's a new struggle it's a yeah. new you know road because I did, I achieved a lot, but it took so much of me that now I have a lot of resentment for yeah. not the sport, but for me as the athlete, who I you were, who you were, right. I was not, I was not a nice person. I was, yeah. I, I, I thought I was, uh, but I was very arrogant. I was mean. Um, one thing I just talked about with one of my clients who does cycle, you know, gear, mm-hmm. uh, very, it's not a tested sport. Uh, I said one regret I wish, I wish I would have done in my career was every time I did a cycle, when I came off, I wish I would have talked to a therapist, not about, not only about how the contest went and the prep went and all that stuff, but about who I was during that, that cycle of steroids, because whether we like to admit it or not, it changes you. On a fundamental level, it changes your fundamental beliefs as a person. It changes your core values as a person. Even if it's in the acute, it changes a lot about you. And that can have long-term devastating effects that are tough to come back from. Yes. That's one thing I wish I would have did. That's a really interesting point. That's something into my most recent contest. I I, uh, started working with a therapist that specializes like in strength sports uh, cerebral well-being. She she's actually over in the UK, um, but it was really awesome. It, and it was really cool to hear like her viewpoints of what she sees in other people. Where you, we love doing strongman, right? And we prep and prep and prep and prep for a show. And then when the show's over, that's where people really get mentally screwed up. Is that post comp blues because you have this uh, high hopes. You're thinking about it, thinking about which is awesome because you love the sport and you're just continuously thinking about these five, six events, whatever. And then it's all over. And if it didn't go as well as you thought, or even if it did go as well as you thought you have that post comp blue. And that's something that really helped me. Um, Yeah. One thing I can tell people is like what the post comp blue things is make sure uh, you cultivate a, an environment of like a, a group of people that, make the training more fun than the competing. I hated hated competing. I did not like competing. Didn't like it. I was good at it. Um, You know, I I felt like I was somebody where even if it was terrible events for me in the show, I would still find a way to win. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, 2019 America's Strongest Man, I didn't win a single event. I got a second place, a third place, a fifth place. You know, you don't have to win every event. Just well-rounded. Um. But the thing that kept me going through all of the losses and everything, um, you know, even with my 
sport of choice now, I hate competing. I still hate competing. I don't like competing. I think competing is just, you know, it's a byproduct of just trying, trying to test yourself. The thing that like got me going was I'm off work. I get to go see my friends. I get yeah. to go see my friends. I get to train. I get to jack around. I get to goof off. Like, and people get so lost in the sauce of wanting to be the best at something and wanting to compete and wanting to like dominate and whatever that they lose sight of like where you're spending a bulk majority of your time. That contest is like what anywhere from five to eight hours, right? Out of a sixteen to twelve to sixteen week cycle. It's like if you're not enjoying the the you know two hours a night of training, then what is the point of any of this? You yeah. Know, you're, you're focused so much on the contest. Sorry about that. No, um, you focus so much on the contest that like you, you, Oh my God, that is my wife. <laughs> um, let me try and silence these. Sorry. No, you're uh, good. Yeah. It's, it's so people get so caught up. That's, yeah. That's such a good point. It resonates with me so much because it goes back to something I was going to say was, um, like you have to love the struggle. Like you said that with it. And I felt so lucky as like an athlete, just not even an, I don't even want to say an athlete. I've just never had to drag myself to the gym. Like, yeah, you have days where you feel crappy or whatever, but I, that's my highlight of every day is going to the gym, having fun with my friends, my training partners. And it's like, yeah, it's fun to compete. I enjoy to compete, but like, it's just a, it's a byproduct. It's a reward, but I, my reward is after work every day going to get the train. So I, I thought yeah. that was such an awesome point. It's uh you know, it's, it's the truth. Like one thing I'm really struggling with right now is going to the gym, like the gym, gym to lift. Uh, I, I don't do it as much as I used to. And it's because I harbor so much resentment for, training because of what it a did to my health, you know, exacerbated by steroid use. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a tough thing for me to break because I have this negative association with it, but slowly, but surely I'm breaking it and getting back into lifting and getting back into training and stuff like that. But, you know, I spend where I used to spend, you know, two to three hours a night at the gym. Now I spend two to three hours a night at jujitsu, you know, and it, that's seven days a week. Right. So you're doing, you know, anywhere from 12 to 13, you know, 10 to 12 sessions a week to 13 sessions a week. And it's just because it's giving me that same feeling that when I started doing strongman, I get where I get to see my friends and I get to, you know, screw it. We kill, we get to murder each other and hate each other for, you know, an hour. And then we go get a beer afterwards and we're best buddies. Um, and that's something that like, I haven't been able to find in the gym, gym down here. And honestly, towards the latter part of my career, I'd say from 2018, Actually, no, from 2017 to 2019, um, my training crew started to like shrink and I was having to train by myself a lot. Now, with that being said, that was the best I had ever competed. I was the strongest I had ever been because I trained alone. Um, you know, I, I would listen to a lot of musicals and Disney music. I always like listening to stuff that makes me really happy. Um, I'm not, I was never an angry lifter. Like the people that were like, oh, you know, like I was happy whenever I lifted yeah. because you should enjoy it. You should have fun. People that like take, take this advice. If you're listening, don't get angry and psyched up and whatever in the gym, it's totally pointless. It's a waste of time. It, you want to keep your training stimulus always at this down low baseline. So that way, when you go to the contest and compete and the people are cheering and you get up here with your adrenaline uh, and your baselines here, you're so much stronger. But if you're constantly here in training, you'll never be here in a contest. It yeah. You'll always, per, I, historically speaking, I've seen people, they always perform worse when they have to gas themselves up in the gym. Um, you know, your gym that's, stuff should be low energy. Yeah. That's something I've definitely learned as I've gotten more experience in lifting is I used to be, man, I look back to the college, like weight room days. Oh man. The shit we were doing. Like I was getting hit upside the head with like energy drinks, smash over my head, like full energy drinks, like getting punch in the face, oh. clapping. Cause it's like you, when you find out about nose torque, it's like crack, like you, your first time, but it's like remember the first time that nose torque hit and now look at it. Now your stimulus is way down because you've uh, so many people have built up this, this uh, wall to it and they they've, they've made themselves used to it. So it's not really working like it would need to work in a competition. If you would 
before a max deadlift, if you're hitting nose torque all the time, it's a, it's a great point. I understand what you're saying completely. So that's awesome. Oh yeah. So were you an athlete when you competed, were you an athlete that liked a coach that was just like, what, what type of athlete were you, what type of coach did you prefer? I guess coaching style. Uh, my first real coach was Matt Mills. He helped me win my 2016 world title. He was very hands off, like barely yeah. gave advice, but like he just had good programming. I just kind of like would wing the stuff. And then I went to Mike Mastel, um, who would give good advice. Uh, he was more like um, of a, hey, like let it go approach. Like things go bad. Like you're not going to win everything. Like he was, he's the one that really ingrained like, uh, you're undersized because he was undersized. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be the most technically proficient person there. If you want to win, the technique has to always be like dialed in a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you're going to win because you know, the Brian Shaw's of the world, the big dudes, like in my weight class, it was always um, like the Clay Andrew Clayton's yep. and stuff like that. Um, they're big. They cut from a lot of weight. I was, I never had to cut. Uh, except for when I did nineties, I cut, uh, but when I was doing two thirty ones, never cut always at or underweight. Um, wow. so I had to be technically proficient and everything because I was smaller than everybody else there. Um, and yeah, I mean, for, for the latter part of my career from 20, uh, like the last probably year and a half, I didn't have a coach. I just did it all myself. Yeah. Um, but that's after learning from a lot of coaches, you know what I mean? Like, right. And just kind of understanding like, um, that like, I know what to do, you know? I right. Don't... Yeah. I think as you go on, you just really learn no matter how good a coach is or experienced a coach is, you learn like on a specific day, how you feel, how to regulate. And, and yep. you know what I mean? It's a great point. Feel for it. As long as you understand, like, especially from like a coaching perspective, as long as you understand progressive overload and, you know, periodization, you know, it's and, and how to be honest with yourself, right? Like you yeah. can say, oh man, I feel really good today. I'm going to hit a single for this online qualifier. But are you just telling yourself that or do you actually feel hundred percent, you know, well, and like, you know, I, I, I had a guy who worked with me for years uh, and then he left to try and do his own thing. And then he came back like three months later. Cause he's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I didn't take him back. Uh, not because I didn't want to work with him because I, I just kind of talked to him. I, I sat down and did a consult with him and I was like, bro, you know what you're doing. You got to like trust yourself. You know, you yeah. got to listen to your body. Like I will 100% say like in the latter part of my career, my training was very minimal. I took a very Dorian Yates approach, go in, hit it hard, hit it fast. I went from having like the three hour gym sessions with my friends. Cause like I said, I was training alone to, I could get in, get out in like 75 to 90 minutes. Uh, including warmups and stuff. I would, it was very like when I was three months out from a contest, everything was so specific to the show. Uh, when I was off season stuff, it was no events, didn't train events because when you get to a certain point in your career and you've been doing this so long, you're not going to forget how to do stones. You're not going to forget how to carry a yoke. You know, it takes maybe one to two, maybe three sessions to get the groove back. But in terms of like losing anything, no, I would honestly say that doing events in the latter part of your career, when you understand the events in bulk, and this is one thing that like uh, my Mel Peacocks, you know, who have been with me for so long when we do off season stuff, if she feels like she, if she's not doing events, she feels like I'm going to lose it. And it's like, that's not how any of this works. Right. You know, you've been doing yeah, this. It's, pro long. it's probably riskier to do stones than, you know, Bingo. you know what it's I mean? Way riskier. It is yeah. so high risk because the 100%. weights you're training at are so much heavier that there's so much room for injury. I mean, again, oh, not man. disparaging anybody, but if you look at JF, Carone, yeah, constantly was training events and he constantly got hurt. He got yeah. hurt a lot. Especially uh, he's an older athlete now too. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's like, it is, it is a sport where it is a lot riskier. If you look at powerlifting, their sport is doing just compound movements, squat, bench, deadlift. You know, ours can be a variety of five to six events that are chose or more that the promoter has no idea. Of, they're not thinking about like the actual human body when they, when they, program those events no, so they may not. be putting things together that are horrible for you to train together you know what i mean 
So, oh man, there was a there was a guy. I'm not going to say names, um, but he was a promoter in a specific state. If I say the state, everybody will know. So I'm not going to say that. Um, but when I say these events, people will know that did the show. Um, he hosted a pro am, and the events were axle clean and press each rep, uh, and tire flip, stones, uh, arm over arm sled drag. And it was like, just like, I think there were six torn biceps in that show Oh, just from like, you can't like promoters yeah. don't think about, you know, yeah. he, here's it. Here's advice to promoters out there. If you want to host a really good show, you need to have one max event, whether it's press or a deadlift or stones, whatever you got to have one max event. Yep. You got to have a rep event. You got to have a grip event. You got to have a medley and you got to have a loading event. Those are the fundamentals. If you have all five of those, you cover all the strengths, you cover everything. It'll be so well balanced as a show that like yeah. the person who is the strongest is going to win. Yeah. I, I see that a lot. Like where I see promoters do two press events or two deadlift events in the same show. And I almost always see that it's not the best athlete that can win that show because like for me, I'm a really good deadlifter, but a bad presser. So it's like, you know, when I have that two, when 40% of the show is pressing, you know, for, for a bad presser, but you may be a good, well-rounded strongman, you know, yeah. just, you know what I mean? So it's a really good point. You, you mentioned you coach Mel, right? Uh, uh, that's probably your, is that your biggest name client? Mel, Melissa? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't work with him anymore. I was coaching Kevin Ferris for a little while. I coached Rob Kearney for a little bit. Okay. Uh, Melissa Peacock. Uh, Danny Vaji. I don't know if people remember her, but she went on a tear for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've coached a lot of pretty, I've, I've worked with a lot of pretty big name people. Um, so what is it like as a coach to work with really high level athletes and nightmare. then same, same exact? It's a nightmare. No, it's a uh, nightmare. It depends, okay. It depends when you get them. If you get really high level athletes that have made it really far just because they're like, either doing a lot of drugs or genetically freaky mm -hmm. um, as a coach, there's not a lot of like give and take, yeah. um, you know, Mel I've cultivated Mel from like a very early stage in her career. So she's very like communicative and like understanding and like she wants to know the plan. Um, and she always gives like good feedback, but like, she's pretty much like, Hey, I'm in it. Like whatever you write, I'm here for it. Like I'll do it. Um, but other big name athletes, like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring someone on and they're like, Hey, my deadlift peaked, you know, I haven't been able to hit a deadlift PR. And then I'll say, Hey man, the problem is, is that you're deadlifting in X position, which is good for this athlete, which I know you train with, but yeah. you are not him. And your best lift is a uh, squat. You should be able to deadlift more. But the problem is, is your deadlift stance is here and your squat stance is here and your deadlift stance is rounded back and you're trying to muscle through it. And your squat is upright and you're pulling, you know, a lot of quad dominated pulling. Let's bring and trying to get them to, to use new modalities and stuff like that, that they're not used to. Um, for instance, I was working with a pretty high name athlete. Uh, in one of his worst events was bag toss. Um, he could not, he had very terrible power out of the hole. bag toss always got him, but he was very explosive as an athlete, but he couldn't get the, the, the straight line power, uh, out of the bottom of the hole for a deadlift. So I was, or for a bag toss. So I was, we were using weight releasers, oh. uh, and which, you know, doing overloaded eccentrics with weight releasers great tool for increasing your vertical power out of the hole. Uh, and he set up the weight releasers wrong and went down with 120%, but they didn't drop off and he couldn't come up. Oh, and, and, you know, that was my fault. Yeah. You know, because yeah. <laughs> he set it up wrong. It was by, it was my fault. I got a tongue lashing from him and, you know, me being me, like, you know, you're working with a high, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have, you know, stood my ground there, but it was like, Hey man, yeah, we won't do those anymore. I'll try to figure out another way. Uh, but in hindsight, it should have just been like, you set it up wrong. Like yeah. that's not on me. I know this works. I know it works because I did it for me and got my bag tossed better. And I've done it for other people and got their bag tossed better. Yeah. So it's like, don't say, Oh, you know, I'm not doing this because I look at 
I don't care if you've been the world's strongest man 50 times. If you have a deficiency in this event, this event, this event that has kept you from not getting on that podium and it's kept you from the podium, I'm going to do what I know will work to get you on the podium. Right. Right. And if you're not willing to do that, then, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's not a cash grab for me. You know, those level athletes are never paying full price. Yeah. Like, so, you know, it's, it's there, they are, it is a headache working with high profile athletes. It really is. Yeah. That's one thing that's always blown my mind about coaching is you're obviously being vulnerable and admitting you need a coach, right? Because for whatever reason, for whatever reason you're hiring a coach and then people that do that and then they refuse to listen to the coach. It, it blows my mind. I, I can never wrap my mind around it because, and if you feel like, I just feel like if, if you're hiring someone you can't trust and you should probably find a new coach, but like also what, like you went to the coach for a reason, you know? And Well, and I think a, a lot of people, whenever they hire a coach, they don't understand that there's a human on the other end of this. Yeah. I'm a human. And like, uh, you know, when I onboard somebody, the first month, to six months is figuring out what they respond best to because people think, Oh, I respond best to this. I respond best to this. Do you? Right. Do you? Right. Do you respond best to this? Or did you have like a pretty good contest one time when you did this thing and then you tried to do it again? Cause obviously they, they figure out what works for them and then they replicate it over and over again. And then they start to do this. Yep. It's like, yep. And it's like also, I think that's a really good point because I think people think something works for them or when they're programming for themselves, one of the biggest faults is that they do what they feel comfortable doing or what they know. And I think that is why you see such a large jump when you like, I know you're a smart guy and, and and there's a lot of smart coaches, but I think just doing something different than what their usual routine has can, can have such a spike in performance because people always resort to what they they know or they're comfortable in. Right. Right. Like, well, and they also see like, you know, I'll have people ask, well, what did, what did you have this person do? And it's like, well, I have them do this. And I'm not, I don't hide my programming. Like nothing I do is revolutionary. Um, you know, Oh, I have them do this, this, and this. Yeah. Well, why aren't, why am I not doing this? Well, cause that won't work for you. Yeah. You know, like you're you're a different person. You're a different person. Individualized programming. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you, if you were to look at Mel's programming, uh, it is so bare bones. She lifts three days a week. Um, she'll get some like heavy work in, in those three days, but it's like three days a week, really low maintenance stuff. And then you would look at somebody like, um, another client of mine who's been pretty successful, uh, Alex cop, Alex has got some like burners in there. Yeah. Um, you know, he, in, in stuff that most people wouldn't be able to do. He like the stuff I would have, if I had Mel do what he does, Mel would be texting me like, are you, do you hate me? Like <laughs> what's going on? But if I have Alex do what Mel does, he'd be like, bro, I'm not getting enough here. Like, I don't feel like this is enough for me. I don't feel anything. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really weird, man. It's, it's all about finding. And that's the thing is like being a coach, a lot of like, this is a continuing education thing. Most coaches, like I see people like, uh, it's really kind of cringe when they put like the conjugate coach or whatever in their programming. And they, all they do is conjugate stuff. And I'm like, people pay you for that. Right. People pay you for something that they can get from a West side book that was published like 10 years ago. And like tells them everything like there's and and not to say anything bad about conjugate. I think conjugate no, works for sure. Great. Uh, but like, it's not the be all end all. No, uh, that that's so funny. You mentioned that. Cause when I, so I started in college, like my first, second year in college at powerlifting, I was under guys that were, they were West side, very well read and everything. And I was lucky for that. And when I got in a strong man, I was so dead set on like, I need to do conjugate for strong man, conjugate for strong man. And I've gotten so far away from that now that it's, I think people are so dead set on one method having to work. And if they would step out of their comfort zone, they would be so oh, happy yeah. and surprised. I think that's so funny because that was me, what you described. So that was cool. Well, I mean, conjugate is such a universal thing. Thanks yeah. to me. And like, yes, like doing max effort balance with dynamic effort work. And there's, there's something to it because you're doing speed and you're doing strength and it does work. However, I will say that, you know, um, I had an athlete of mine 
we were working together and I got him so freaking strong. He had a 440 log press and then he had a chance wow. to train under Louie and he went to train at Louie's uh, and he did not get, he got weaker. Yeah. Uh, and you know, he would come to, he'd be like, man, I'm getting weaker. And I'm like, well, yeah, man. It's like, yeah. That, and it's also Louie. Cause you're on this, you're on this very specific tunnel vision thing. And it's like the world is out here. Right. And yeah. And I've read so much Louis Simmons and, and I've got to meet him and, um, but he was so he fantasized about lifting the most possible weight for geared power lifting. So I think that maybe he didn't have the, he wasn't that well read on strongman. I don't, I just don't think he was not saying he's not one of the smartest coaches ever. I'm just saying maybe he didn't spend a lot of his time in strongman. He was obsessed with pow geared powerlifting and obsessed with mixed martial arts. That's what Louis liked if you read him. So to apply it to strongman, like I remember, I don't know if you know who Anthony Oliveira is, one of the best squatters at West Side. He owns a gym, I yeah. believe, in Connecticut now. Awesome dude. Like such a good follow on Instagram. And I remember when I first started strongman, I asked him advice. And he sent me like a really nice message back with like five to ten coaches and was like, hey, man, I'm a geared power lifter under Louis Simmons. Strongman wasn't our thing. These are probably people you should reach out to. And like, I respect that so much because he probably could have just gave me powerlifting That's template with yeah. a log in there and, you know, charge me money. But like, so I really respect that. So, yeah, it's, little... it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a million ways to, to skin a cat and get, you know, um, the end result you're looking for. But honestly, the biggest thing is if you're doing conjugate or if you're doing anything is the intent of the athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, I have videos that I send my athletes that are strictly focused on like, this is the intent that I want you to apply on the movements. Because if you're just going through and doing this movement, it's not going to work. You're not like the human body is so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The human body is so literate in what it will physiologically express with what you give it you lift slow you're gonna go slow you yeah. lift fast you're gonna get faster you know like it's it's so specific and so like the human body for as incredible it is it's very dumb and like linear in terms of what it responds very adaptive to. like to what you yeah put on it. it's crazy yeah it's so you have to like you know i i had a client of mine that was not he was like i, I need to get a faster yoke and i'm like well go faster <laughs> like, well, I can't. And I'm like, that's, you have, that's the point. Like go lighter, that's a, go that's faster. A really. When you say it like that, it's, it's so, it's so simple, but it makes sense. Like just that intent, you know, is. Yeah. Is it's awesome. the intent. That's what Mike Mastel told me. Like he was yeah. my second coach. I'm going to start stealing that. Now. That's, that's really good. I like that a lot. Oh dude, I got a bunch of them. My favorite one is, uh, whenever we're doing like, we'll do some like, you know, um, glycolysis training where we'll do like, you know, 30 seconds on 90 seconds off stuff. Like with who's carries, I'll do like six round who's heavy 30 seconds on carry 90 seconds off. It's fucking brutal. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the language, but he, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and I'll have my athletes do this. And oh my God, it sucks. And I'm like, well, faster you do it, the faster it's done. And they're like, it. what? And I'm like, yeah. faster you do it, the faster it's done, bro. Like yeah. the quicker you get it done, the quicker it'll be done. Yeah, just get it, get, get, just going. get it done. Like, yeah, right. You know, well, yeah, I love that, man. I love that a lot. You know, it's, another another thing about programming, like the intent, how you move, like you just spoke about. And do you think there's something to just believing in a in your coach and your program? Like, hundred percent. Yeah, I've really noticed that. Just seeing people, the people that are real, you're the people that are really bought in and believe it. And it's like my coach is awesome. Like Terry Rady won America's Strongest Man in 2019. He's awesome. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. And those are the people that really have a lot of success. I I feel. You know? I mean, yeah, my my most successful clients like just they buy into it. And the problem is, is people think like buying in is, um, you know. Oh, I, I was with him for six months. That's not buying in. Oh. A, a pro, like, uh, I don't know if you know who she is. Her name's Kim Scott. Mm -hmm. She just won OSG regional. Like she's been really getting strong. When Kim and I started working together, she could not press a, like a 120 pound log. She oh. was, she couldn't, you know, she wouldn't have been able to even podium at like a local show. Uh, and then we started working together and we, she's bought in. She does it. 
I tell her, don't do this. Don't do this. She's very like, okay. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And now she has went like that because she buys into something and she understands also that, Hey, this isn't a, a quick game. You know, this isn't boom like this. And, you know, right now she's getting strong and she's starting to get that. Well, why, why is this not like this? Why? And I'm like, Kim, remember this journey. We've been on this, yeah. we've been on this journey for two years and you're finally getting to these spots. And she's like, you're right. And I'm like, yeah, man, like your it's career hard. Is quicker than mine. It is it's hard when an athlete has success. Like I've, I've fell with that with myself, like where you just put this like super unfair pressure and like cadence on yourself now to be like something you you're not at the time, you know? And it's like, and the worst part is, is the pressure you feel is generated from yourself. It's because so stupid. You think if you're not here, others are thinking something about you. Right. It's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So like 2022 strongman corp nationals, like I won. And, um, and after that, I put such an unfair pressure on myself where I thought I had to win everything. And like, Mm -hmm. it's, it's just so stupid. It is. It's so stupid. I I listened to a podcast with George St. Pierre on it. You know, George St. Pierre, I'm I'm assuming you you do, you do jujitsu now. But uh, and he was saying what he would do after he won his first world championship or something, he put this unfair pressure on himself. Right. And where he and he couldn't sleep. And he said what he would do before his fights is he would go to a local grocery store wherever he was fighting and he would just go walk around and he would not get noticed. You know, the old lady over there wouldn't notice him. The dad wouldn't notice him. And he's like, what I'm doing is so small on this earth versus the grand scheme of just life. And that's a huge mixed martial art. What we're doing is even way smaller. So like I heard that quote and it helped me a lot, honestly. Like I thought that was cool to just. Yeah. Like when you achieve something in the sport, like I'm sure if GSP went to, you know, MMA con or something right. like that, we'll be like, oh my God, that's George St. Pierre in your circles. Like me, uh, I go to the Arnold. People are like, whoa. Yeah. I'm right. meeting you. It's like, Hey man, it's, it makes you feel good. But yeah. like, I go to the fucking Starbucks over here and they're like, <laughs> you're the guy that likes nitro cold brew, right? I'm like, right. Yes, right. that's me. And it's yeah, like, it's no so one, funny. it's such a niche sport too. It's like, it's, we get so, I, I, I think it's a, that, that movie character, the main character syndrome, like it's, you it, think it's hundred percent, you get that main character syndrome and in, in hindsight, people lose themselves in that main character. And that's one thing I'm like combating with a few of my athletes. Like I was talking about with the therapy thing is we get so caught up in the main character syndrome that it, it takes the fun out of this. It really does. Uh, And you know, I, if you're, if anyone's listening to this podcast, when you start winning something, or if you're currently winning stuff, um, don't get so lost in the sauce. Like enjoy the moment, enjoy the ride. Like you're going to win, you're going to lose. It's going to suck. But at the end of the day, in five years, no one's going to remember what you won or lost. You right. will, you know, exactly. like I won a ton of stuff, but do you, th- how many people fucking know about it? Not a ton, like OGs, right. you know, that are in the sport, but outside of that, who cares? You right. know, it's, that's- it's, it's such a good point, man. And it's like, uh, I have people like, oh man, I have to go compete or I have to go to the gym or I have to go do this contest, whatever. It's like, I would never do a contest if I didn't want to do it. Yeah. Like we're, we're all even professionals in strongman, like pro card, like you have your pro card are still essentially an amateur in a sport because you're not really making money. You're not like at the end of the day, no matter what you do, you're yeah. you're losing money, right? I I, I went to like nationals. Five hundred bucks. I went to time. nationals and won and got paid for winning, and it still wasn't enough money to pay for my trip. And it was in the same state I live in. That's you crazy. know what I mean. So so it's it, and it. I think people forget how niche and small this sport is. It's yeah. crazy. It's oh, crazy. dude. I I signed up for the uh, Austin Open down here, IBJJF Austin Open, uh, and it was on a whim. I think I had had like four or five micheladas i was kind of fucking toasted whenever i signed up for it uh-huh. and we were sitting at the bar and i was like yeah, i'll do it and then the contest came around and i looked at my wife and i was like we got to drive three and a half hours to go to this contest and i texted my coach i said i'm not going he said why and i said i don't want to 
Like, yeah. I just don't want to go. Like, yeah, I'll do the Dallas one in two weeks because it's like 30 minutes from the house. I don't want to go. Dude, I don't. It is so funny. Like, uh, when I started coaching full time, I had this vision of like, I wanted to travel and be this guy and do the social media and whatever. And then I, you know, I, I get married and, you know, life starts settling in and I'm very successful, but uh, now it's to the point where I don't want to do any of that. I want to stay home. I don't want to see anybody. I want to go train. I want to like, you know, yeah. I don't want to travel. I don't want to like, I, I doubt I'm going to OSG this year. I didn't go to the Shaw. Like I didn't, you know, I, I don't hang out at contests anymore and it has nothing to do with like, Oh, you don't want to be there for your athletes. It's like, no, my athletes should know how to compete. Like they don't need me there. Like I understand like, Oh, my coach is here. It's like, I feel empowered, but it's like, I'm not always going to be there. I'm empowering you right. on our phone calls every week. I'm empowering you. Yeah. On it's, it's, something. it's all the, it's all the prep work that has led into this. Like, and I'm sure if they're at a contest, although you're not there, you have an open line of communication. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So like, like I'm here. Right. Like it's, Katie Gutwald is, uh, do you know Katie? Yeah. She's a good friend of ours. She's a good Katie friend is. I have watched Katie from the start of her career and uh, she's always been so hard on herself. Yes. Um, and when we started working together, yeah, when we started working together, that was one thing I was trying to break. I was trying to break this person that, you know, she thought she needed to be. And uh, I told her that like, she'll truly be able to do some really cool things and get where she wants to get when she really starts to understand that, like, uh, not only does that she is strong, but like the pressure that she feels is totally fabricated from nothing. Right. And now she's like, I mean, she just set the farmer's she world, set record. a farmer's record, right? Like she, I, mean, I wasn't there like, you know, and like, I haven't been to some of her contests and like, she's really starting to turn into the athlete that I always knew she could be and starting to have fun. She was right. not having fun for a while. Like she was very hard on herself. And I'm like, dude, Luke, your husband in <laughs> business and everything Who's the best else. guy ever. Yeah. Like everything. Oh, dude, he'll text me at a contest and it'll be like, she's not doing great mentally. Can you <laughs> and I'm like, I'll shoot her a text. Yeah, we got yeah. this. Bro. Like him and I are, we're, we're yeah, Luke's Luke's awesome. We've, we've gotten to know them real well and become friends with them. So when we're at a contest like nationals or the Arnold, we're always in like stand, like, you know, together in our little athlete group, Dude, they're great friends. He is becoming the person I thought she could be, which is this one of the strongest people at the show. And it was only after she understood that like, oh, this is fun. This right. is my escape This from everything else. And when you can treat strongman and your niche sport as like this beautiful hobby that you get to do and you get to meet people and you get to cultivate these relationships that are going to last a lifetime – uh, then it's just supplementary to everything else, which is your job and your marriage and your relationship outside of the sport. When it becomes that, that is when you will truly be the strongest person you've ever been because you're happy. You're, you're, I, I always talk about with my clients, feedback loops, we're creating these positive feedback loops and they reinforce each other. If my marriage is good and my work is good and my training is good, then I'm in this loop. When one gets messed up, it can affect the other too. Right. Uh, when I have a bad a, training day back in the day, it would affect my personal relationships. And when my personal relationships get affected, it affected my job. And I couldn't figure out it's why. A big chain. It's a big chain. Exactly. It's a chain. Crazy. And you have to constantly just like frame your perspective in the chain. What can I do? Which part of the chain is weak right now? How can I fix that part of the chain? When you address it, we get moving again. So yeah. I think it's I think it's remembering that this is a privilege. Like Hundred percent. Just even on the baseline, physically, it's a privilege to be able, be physically able to go to a gym or go to a contest and compete. And like I know you've had injuries, I'm sure, throughout your career, right? I mean, never, never had a, like I, a the only injury I ever had was uh, I had a broken foot in uh, for ASM 2019. I had a bunch of micro fractures in my right foot from carrying a uh, 1,200 pound yoke. Right. Um, okay. So that was so like. But when, when people hurt their back or, or yeah, yeah. Or, like that type of shit, I mean? a little like, nagging. Thing. Yeah. Those little naggy stuff where you can't really like bend down and touch your toes. Like you mm -hmm. realize like, holy crap, like this could be over in 
the blink of an eye, like where I need physical therapy. I need, I'm going to be out for two years. Like that's why I stress to people. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And oh, dude, you know what Ter- I mean? like uh, Mike O'Connor is somebody that is probably one of the most mentally strong people I've ever met because he's an awesome follow too. He, he tore his bicep. At yep. that last show. Yeah, the the, cla- he, I think the last class, class, right? Yeah. Tore his bicep, was texting me through it. He's like, ah, I'm still going to do the show. And mm-hmm. I'm like. Which was awesome to watch. Yeah. Like, Mike's, do, you co- do you coach Mike? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's so he has a he's a, he has a whoop. So I'm in the same whoop group as him. And like, <laughs> I follow like his uh like he posts actually a lot on Instagram, like the zones that he tries to stay in oh, yeah. like, during training. Uh, that's why I got one because I'm like a I'm a nerd with that stuff. I like to like so I, I like to see another athlete, especially such a high level one like Mike, like utilize that, you know. I just want to look like him when I'm his age. Dude, it's wild. How dude, old is dude. how old is he? Do you know? I, I think like he's mid to late thirties. Yeah, think. he's dude. He's jacked. Yeah, he is a very yeah. impressive specimen. You but know, Mike is just another one of those people that's like when he tore his bicep. The he got home from class. She said, "Hey, man, surgeries. I got surgery scheduled right away. We'll get mm-hmm. right back to it." And no, oh, this sucks. None of that. Yeah. Like, he's like, yeah, I've done this before. It's not a big deal. He said, "Let's just do some of this. Like, we'll do some off season stuff." He's like, "Not a big deal. We'll get back to it." Yeah, and like, that's the mindset you got to have with all this. Hundred percent. I'm so jealous of, of that, world, bro. Yeah, it's never the end of the world. Even and here's the thing. Even if it is, say you blow out both your biceps and your doctor's like never going to get reattached you can't do strongman anymore there are so many other things out there right. like people forget that the the 10 to 15 years that you compete in strongman is like an eighth of your life right it's just a yeah, right. chapter dude and it's yeah. a hard chapter to close it was hard for me to close a lot of nights staying up a lot of therapy because i was so my identity was so tied into strongman and this person that i was and this person online that's why i post barely anymore i think in the last year i've posted like three times on instagram and it's because yeah. like i have separated myself from that because i realized it became a part of my identity to be this person and i didn't why right. like i am not that i'm a husband I'm a friend. I'm a, a leader. I am, you know, so much more than whatever this is, this 100%. fake thing that it's like, like, it goes back to what we were saying. It's a, just a privilege and just have fun. Like, yeah, it dude, should have be fun. fun, dude. Even Strong, it's so fun. If you are the novice of the most novice listening right now, or you're as top level as they come listening right now, like it should be fun for everyone. I Should, firm, I firmly believe that. And I think that mindset is so true with what you were saying with Mike is, and that's something I think everyone, myself included, needs to work on is like, I know when I've had little injuries, I've been like, woe is me. And I'll lay around and think it's the end of the world. And it's like, dude, I strained my lower back. You know, I'll be fine in three weeks. You know oh, dude, I, mean? I got like, a, a, he's been working with me about a year. His name's Kurt. And, uh, you know, when we first started working together, he's like, oh, my elbow, my elbow hurts. And I'm like, Okay. He's like, well, what can we do to fix it? And I'm like, keep training. And he's like, well, what, what do you mean? And I'm like, bro, new movements, like shit's going to hurt. Like it's right. You did not pick a friendly sport. Like the sport hurts <laughs> unless your elbow explodes, then we'll right. address it. But like, you've got some like inflammation and tendonitis, like ice it, lay off it for a couple of days. It's probably going to keep hurting for a little bit, but your body will get used to it. And then I swear two weeks later, he's like, my elbow doesn't hurt anymore. And I'm like, yeah, man, like your body um, ebbs and flows, man. Everything ebbs adapts, flows. ebbs and flows, dude. Like, dude, it's so funny. My, my best friend, Jimmy just started like, like uh, within the year, like coming down to my gym and like training strongman on Saturdays. And he's never been like a, like a he- heavy into strength. Tra- he's, he's been in a gym, but more like machines and stuff like that. And, you know, he started saying, you know, oh man, my low back's tight, you know, after he's done like sandbag his shoulder and, getting heavier on deadlifts and we're just like man it's that's welcome to strength training he'll listen to it he listened to every episode like welcome to strength training man like you're gonna wake up some mornings and you're gonna feel like shit and that's not a great answer but it is the nature of the beast that's dude you know if if you didn't feel that way you wouldn't be getting any stronger right you know it's like dude when i was deep in it like from the years of 2015 to 2019 when i was just I, I didn't, I think I only lost a couple shows in that time period. And, um, 
when I was deep in it, like I constantly just, my body was just thrashed, man. Yeah. And I was, you just, and I was working a job where I was eight hours a day outside working on chemical feed skids and grids and pumps at wastewater and water treatment plants, okay. driving anywhere from two to eight hours a day sometimes, like just to get to these places to work the next day. Like my hips were always tight, but like, you know, I'd bust ass, beat my body into the dirt, you know, get off work at six, go to some local rinky dink, anytime fitness and yep. get it with these hexagon plates, getting <laughs> heavy deadlifts in Got like a deadlift with them, huh? Yeah. Drop the bar on the ground. It rolls back into my shins prepping for the Arnold. Like it just, it is what it is. I mean, like you just, I yeah. remember there's, there's a video on my Instagram of me in the rain. I carried around a circus dumbbell with me. Uh, Cause I'd never pressed a circus dumbbell before the 2018 Arnold. I've never done oh, one. Wow. Yeah. And I had 10 weeks to learn how to press a circus dumbbell. Mike and I, he said, go figure out your max. I hit a 170 dumbbell for one uh, and the comp weight was 180. And so I just took this circus dumbbell, Christina Bangma, let me borrow it. And I carried it in my work truck everywhere I went. And it got to the point where I would practice with spray paint cans to get the movement down. And then the last like, four or five, four weeks of prep. I had this dumbbell in my truck and every hour I would go out and I would do 10 empty reps with this circus dumbbell just to get the movement pattern That's down. Sweet. And then contest came around and I hit 180 for 10 in the show and ended up winning the event. So it worked. So, so everyone's going to be pressing with a, with a spray can now. Everyone's going to have a spray can and driving around with the circus dumbbell. It's, dude, I tell all my clients that you want to learn a movement that you don't know. You want to learn it, do it with a, a just, friggin PVC pipe. You want to learn how to do a split jerk, split jerk in your living room with a PVC pipe, do a hundred reps a day, hundred yeah. reps a day with just no engrave it in those neurons, man. Dude, like, shit. People it's so the, the body, the, just like I was talking about, the body is so simple and easy to trick that if you just do the thing, you'll learn it. Yeah. You don't have sense. to have weight. Just yeah. do the thing. Yeah. You know, your hips tight. You want to get, you want to get more mobility, do the thing. Do it as much as you can all the time with no weight, like something that doesn't stress your body out. You're just ingraining, yeah. like just you said. Just ingraining it right in there. That's what I always laugh about when when people think that deload week into a contest is going to like ruin them. And I'm like, man, you've been doing this stuff for eight, 10, 12 Three months. Weeks. And yeah. you've done it and you've done it in contests previous. Like you're not going to forget how to pick up a heavy Husafel stone. Like you've done it. Yeah. The job's done now. That's one of the hardest things to explain to new people is like really in that week leading up, you can do so much more damage than you can do good mm -hmm. in a gym. And it's awesome. Like, you know, when people are deloading in our gym, they'll come down and they'll walk on the turf, you know, and hang out and maybe help load a plate or something and just stretch with a band. But I see so many people do more harm than good in the gym the week before. And I'm sure you, you do as well, you know? Oh dude. It's yeah. People I've got just, it's, it's crazy where, where the human mind can go with you, you're sitting at home and you have that two hour time frame that you don't, the open that you normally don't have right when you go to the gym a couple of days a week and like people can just let those thoughts eat them up with yep. hey i'm gonna forget how to do this i'm gonna i'm gonna zero this event i'm gonna like my my thing that i like doing um before contests and stuff like that and i tell my clients this i told katie this before the last show i said go like get monopoly deal or mm -hmm. some card game play with your friends and family just have yeah. play cards with your family go for long walks with your pets like that's the i always like i'm a dopamine guy so it's like anything that i can get like those like dopamine hits of like feeling good that's like very low impact on yes. the cns that's the best way to go into a show man 100% you know what and that's that's one thing I actually, I don't do a really big water cut. I'm probably pretty small for an 80 kg guy, like for how, how much I cut. But I've always said one thing I actually like about my water cut is it gives me structure in that week leading up to the show. I'm a, I'm a human of structure and it gives me something to do. Like yeah. it gives me a goal every day. Like I review my nutrition plan. Hey, make these meals, drink this exact amount of water, whatever. And it, it just, it keeps me busy. I need to be busy. Like that's just how I am. And I'm sure that's how a lot of people are. I was not that way. I was late <laughs> and during deload weeks, I but, would, uh, 
you know, play Fallout or Dark Souls and just veg out because I didn't have to cut. I didn't yeah. have to, you know, that stuff. So I'd just be like, uh, you know, yeah. brain. Every, I like every athlete's different. Yeah, absolutely, man. Every athlete's different. Like, I, I think that's can't be stressed enough. And I'm sure yeah. you see that with a coach, like in your approaches, in your approaches in coaching, you have to probably athlete a, you treat a lot different than athlete B, right? Oh, um, everybody gets treated. Everybody. Different. It's, it's the same thing in the workplace. You know, you talk to this coworker different than you talk to this coworker. Every human is different. So, you know, it's the same yeah. as prepping or, you know, everything. Yeah. Like, it's funny you say that my had a client, Steph Bizigano, she's a Canadian pro and she was competing at the Shaw. And before the last couple contests, she's always gotten hurt, like on the T load week doing something silly. And this week, this one, I told her, I said, look, you go to the show. She's like, well, I want to see the mountains. I want to do this. And I said, no, I said, no, I do anything fall down the mountain. after the show. She said, <laughs> all right. And I said, you go to the hotel and you sit there in a box and you don't move. Yep. Okay. And then she's like, I got through the show and didn't get hurt. And I, I actually did really well. I felt like I did pretty good. And I'm like, cool, go hike. Now go, now you the- go hike. Yeah. Now yeah, you yeah. can do the fun stuff. Shoot him like bubble boy. You yeah. Know, she, she yeah. is my bubble boy. She's my yeah. bubble boy. I'm like, yeah, but, um, that's, that's, that's hilarious. hilarious. My, uh, my, uh, my first ever powerlifting meet, I was on an elliptical screwing around the night before and my shoelace got caught. Oh on the God. elliptical and it flipped me and I like had a huge knee bruise going like, I mean, I was going to total like 1100, you know, I was 18, but that was my, I, I became a, yeah, I became a lot more of a, yeah, <laughs> I became more of a bubble boy leading into cost from that first ever experience where it's like, God damn. Like, yeah. But like, you were 18 then. I mean, like <laughs> yeah. you're, the resiliency at 18, how old are you now? Uh, I'm 29. So. Okay. So you're creeping into that 30 territory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the re- dude. Dude, Trust me, I would I, be if that happened to me now, I would have probably just went home. Like yeah, I, yeah, you're debilitated. You're like, <laughs> well, yeah, it's really funny. Uh, I'll go to this, you know, the gym or whatever, and I'll train with these like 20 year olds, and they're like, you yeah, know, man. all this and in my face, and I'm like, like fucking, what are you doing, man? Like, <laughs> relax. Like, and they're like going hard, and I'm like, okay, like I yeah. Dude, I had my IBS flared up today, dude. I don't have time for this. Like, like, what are you doing, man? Yeah. So I just give him a foot sweep, put him to the ground, and then hold him there for a second. I'm like, you stop. When yeah. you're done spazzing, we'll we'll roll. But like, I don't have yeah. time for this right now. Yeah, yeah. man. So fun. you know, it sounds like it sounds like jujitsu is like your new passion, and you can tell you're clearly happy with it. Jujitsu and coaching is like is a main part of your life now. Do you, do you think you'll ever compete in strongman again? Like on a, like a local level, like ever? Never. Nope. nope. I just, uh, man, I am, you know, uh, this is going to sound extremely arrogant. Um, but I think that, you know, my last contest was 2019 America's strongest man. And it had Nick Camby, James Deffenbaugh, who was an ASM champion. Anthony Furman was there. Um, it had a lot of stuff staunch competition at that ASM. And that was my last show and I won it. It was the last title I wanted to win. I had won an OSG title. I won the Arnold title. I'd wanted to win America's strongest man. I won the national uh, North American log and deadlift championships. I had won everything I had ever wanted to win except for ASM. And then I finally won an ASM and I was just like capped there. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's cool. Like that was it. Like I was like, okay, like I can step away and like, look back on my career and be like, man, I did a lot of shit. Um, you know, I, I take like, uh, I bring not that I am the Michael Jordan of strongman that is, uh, like Sean D Marinas or Zach McCarley. Um, those are the MJs. But like, when you look at like his career, like he had won a bunch of stuff, then he came back and did that wizard stint and you're like, bro, your career was so good. Yeah. Why yeah. are you coming back? And Michael doing- Jordan would be so more illustrious in my opinion. Had indeed. he not done that? I, I agree. And I that's, agree. that's me. I don't want to come back. I don't want to now again, for those of you listening saying, how oh, dare, you know, there's other guys. It's like, dude, I'm just saying, yeah, I did a lot in my career. I got to here and I don't want to come back. And like, yeah, and it's, it's also that you don't need to even compare yourself against others. It's like, you're personally proud of what you accomplished. Exactly. That's awesome. And also like, like strong is hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah it's just really sure. hard. And I know what I had, like, I know how hard I trained and like, I don't want to do that. Like, yeah, that's so tough. It's also having all those miles on you, right? Oh, like, dude. 
even for you being a younger person in the scheme of life, you're, you're a young guy still, but, but you have the strongman miles on you. And it's like, that's, you Dude, know, I did log clean and press the other day and hit three thirty five. out of nowhere, just hit three thirty five on log clean and press. And when I tell you, I wanted to commit like Sapuku right there on the platform just because of how my body felt after that. I was like, yeah. I didn't need, I'm going to kill myself. This yeah. is, <laughs> I feel horrible right now. Right. My wife watched my clean and she goes, oh. <laughs> I was like, was it bad? She was like, it wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> like, and keep in mind, like the frame of the frame of reference, my best log ever was like 415. So like 335 yeah, yeah, yeah. to me is like that's weak sauce, but like I do it and I'm like, that was like damn really hard. Right. Like RPE 12. Like, and I'm just like, I don't in my mind, I'm like, I could never feel the drive to like want to even hit like a 360 log. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. And sure, but like now I'm like, I don't want to do that. Right. I want to get makes sense. I want to get a juicy bench, you know? 100 percent Power snatch. Like that's it. That's all I want to do. Different curls, stuff. whatever. Yeah. Right. Sure as hell well, not gonna squat. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I appreciate the time so much. I thought that was an awesome conversation. Oh, dude, I this was a great one. You're a great podcast host, man. You're Thanks, you asked man. a lot of good questions. You're very, means you're a very lot. communicating too. Yeah, keep, I keep appreciate it. Well, I put that. up I put up that thing for coaches to to have on because I'm I'm really trying to like be a student of the game and, and learn a lot from some of the top coaches and you were thrown in there a ton. And I've talked to Katie about you uh, a bunch and, and she loves you, you know, your coaching. So I love Katie, man. It's uh it's funny. Like our politics don't align <laughs> people. Like, like I, there was always this weird, like politic thing, like barrier. And then she was like, I want to work with you regardless of any of that. And then we started working together and we're like, Oh, politics don't matter. And which yeah. I've never thought they did. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter. But like she like was like, oh, dude, I love you. And I was like, I love you, man. Like <laughs> yeah, you don't so typically need more. to watch like the RNC debate with your strongman coach. So, oh, dude, I, I that was my, one of my favorite things I've ever watched. My wife <laughs> and I just like sat back on the couch and like we're eating popcorn and we were like, this is a hoot. Are you <laughs> people like this is crazy? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think most Americans right now are kind of over everything. Like, I, I think we're all slowly coming to the same team, and we're all like, "Wait a minute, you all are the problem." You oh, know, like, percent, man. Yeah, I don't see any political. I live in Texas, dude. Yeah, I'm on the left, and I live in Texas, and even my Texas friends are like, "You're kind of right on some stuff." And I'm like, <laughs> so are you? Like, yeah, you know, so for sure, man. Yeah. Well, Ter this Terry, great. I, thanks yeah, for having man. me on. Of course, you're welcome anytime. Awesome. Heck yeah. Anytime you want to have me, just let me know.